Hey, uh, thank you very much. Uh, it is uh, a pleasure um, to, uh, to be here uh, and good afternoon. So uh, I was invited to present the International Society for Anesthetic Pharmacology's inaugural Mohammed Naguib lecture. Uh, and to say that I'm honored and humbled would be a uh, major understatement. We always called each other brother. Uh, and the presentation for me is uh, very personal. Uh, in the brief uh, summary of a friend's life, uh, I will try to distill uh, some of the many strengths that Muhammad possessed. Uh, and I'll talk about his uh, education followed by a glimpse into Muhammad the scientist, uh, followed by Muhammad the family man, the artist, uh, and the teacher. Uh, I will close with a brief synopsis of what might be needed to continue his tremendous legacy. Before presenting the tremendous accomplishments, I just wanted to disclose my potential biases and conflicts of interest. Uh, yes, I am biased because I knew Muhammad, the father, the scientist, the private person, the teacher, and the collaborator, and also the insightful thinker, and I really miss him. Uh, I will not discuss any off-label use of pharmaceuticals or devices. Uh, I do have intellectual property, which I had uh, to disclose to my employer, Mayo Clinic. In the remote past, I received industry and federal research grants, uh, which were paid to Mayo Clinic, not to me personally. And uh, I'm uh, shareholders, member of the board of directors, and chief medical officer um, for a Swedish uh, medical device company, Senzai. Uh, and I'm a member of the scientific advisory boards for three other companies uh, for which I received no compensation. So I think it would be very fitting to start uh, this uh, relatively short story uh, about my friend with a picture from the early 1970s when Muhammad was in medical school in Cairo. And I'm indebted to his daughter, Yusser, for graciously sharing this photo with me. Um, in case you're wondering which one Muhammad is, uh, he would be the very uh, easy to pick out uh, if you knew him. Uh, yeah, he is the young gentleman on the extreme left of the picture, putting the bunny ears on his wife's head. I'm not exactly sure what his wife, uh, Mona Sabri, thought about this, but I would have loved to see a picture of Muhammad around 30 seconds after this particular picture was taken. His uh, educational background is enviable. Uh, he received his uh, degree in natural science from Cairo University Faculty of Science in 1971, followed by his medical degree, uh, which he obtained uh, with honors from Cairo University Faculty of Medicine. This was in 1976. His medical degree was then followed by his master's of science in anesthesia, again, attained with distinction from the Cairo University Faculty of Medicine in 1980. His uh, PhD thesis was entitled Interpulmonary Shunting and Hemodynamic Changes During and After Withdrawal of Sodium nit Nitroprusside or Nitroglycerin Following Induced Hypotension. Muhammad's anesthesia training was gained in the Department of Anesthesia at Cairo's University National Cancer Institute followed by a four-year period as assistant specialist at King Faisal University in Saudi Arabia. In 1985, Muhammad passed the requirements to become a fellow of the Faculty of Anesthetists of the Royal College of Surgeons in Ireland, um, which was the equivalent of the American Board of Anesthesiology certification. It was not unusual for Muhammad to reminisce about his time in Ireland and he was always proud of his association with the Royal College. Because of my own personal connection with the faculty of anesthetists, Muhammad and I spoke quite often about the college and he attended several meetings that Professor Cunningham and I organized in Ireland. Muhammad was always a willing speaker and shared his knowledge and experience freely. And he was also among the first to accept invitations to lecture and teach. 
For instance, the lecture that he presented at the 2000 Anesthesia and Critical Care Symposium in Killarney, Ireland, was typical of Muhammad. He discussed a topic that may have been considered, at least by those of us who did not know him personally, to be outside his area of expertise. But that would be entirely wrong. Muhammad not only volunteered to present a problem-based learning discussion, but he selected one that would best fit with the rest of the conference program, hypercapnia during the emergence from anesthesia. So whatever Muhammad did, he did 100% and he knew and understood the topics of his lectures better than anyone else in the audience. He loved the challenge and the rewards of learning as much as he loved teaching. Even after receiving his multiple degrees from Egypt and Ireland, Muhammad was not satisfied as he very much wanted to have a medical and research career in the United States. So in 1992 and 1993, Muhammad served as a postdoctoral research fellow in the Department of Anesthesiology at the University of California in San Diego. This research fellowship prepared him for his later work in neurodegenerative diseases and pain management. Between 1999 and 2004, he joined the Department of Anesthesiology at the University of Iowa, Harvard College of Medicine in Iowa City as professor with tenure. Between 2004 and 2010, Muhammad was tenured professor at the University of Texas MD Anderson Cancer Center in Houston, Texas. And from 2010 until his untimely passing in 2020, Muhammad was professor in the Department of General Anesthesiology at the Cleveland Clinic uh, in Cleveland, Ohio. So in the uh, Next few slides, I'll try to summarize some of Dr. Naguib's important scientific contributions. And I will do that in two areas of interest, um, neurodegenerative diseases and Alzheimer's and neuromuscular physiology, pharmacology and monitoring. So I'll start with his contributions in pain, neurodegenerative diseases and Alzheimer's disease. In this report, Dr. Naguib and his collaborators described the pharmacological characteristic of MDA7, a cannabinoid type 2 or CB2 receptor agonist, and its potential role in modulating the neural damage caused by antineoplastic drugs. So MDA7 is a CB2 selective agonist, and the effects of MDA7 in reversing neuropathic pain were assessed in spinal nerve ligation and also chemotherapy-induced neuropathy models. MDA7 treatment attenuated tactile allodynia produced by spinal nerve ligation or by the antineoplastic drug paclitaxel. These effects were selectively antagonized by the CD2 receptor antagonist, but not by the other cannabinoid receptor 1 or CD1. Uh, or by antagonists of opioid receptors. So Dr. Naguib and colleagues thus confirmed that MDA7 was effective in suppressing neuropathic pain. Complex regional pain syndrome type 1 is one of the most clinically challenging neuropathic pain syndromes, and its mechanism has not been fully characterized. Cannabinoid receptor 2, or the CB2, has emerged as a promising target for treating different neuropathic pain syndromes. Dr. Naguib and colleagues hypothesized that a CB2 agonist could modulate neuroinflammation and neuropathic pain in a model of complex regional pain syndrome type 1 by regulating CB2 signaling. Based on some of their previous research, Dr. Naguib and co-investigators found that MDA7 treatment had significant neuroprotective effects, which were blocked by a CB2 antagonist. These findings suggest that MDA7 may offer an innovative therapeutic approach for treating neuropathic symptoms 
and neuroinflammatory responses induced by complex regional pain syndrome type 1 as a result of ischemia or reperfusion injury. Peripheral neuropathy is the major dose-limiting side effect of chemotherapy, especially after multiple courses of paclitaxel, which is a cancer drug. The development of paclitaxel-induced neuropathy is associated with the activation of microglia, followed by release of pro-inflammatory cytokines in the spinal cord dorsal uh, horn. Dr. Naguib's group had previously shown that CB2 receptors are expressed in the microglia in the neurodegenerative disease models. So in this study, Dr. Naguib and colleagues explored the effectiveness of CB2 agonists in preventing paclitaxel-induced neuropathy. To test this hypothesis, the authors designed and synthesized a CB2 selective agonist compound called MDA7. Dr. Naguib and co-investigators found that MDA7 treatment interfered with early events in the paclitaxel-induced neuroinflammation, it reduced the number of activated microglia and astrocytes, and it reduced secretion of pro-inflammatory mediators actually without compromising the drug's antineoplastic effects. So these findings paved the way for an innovative therapeutic approach to prevent chemotherapy-induced neuropathy, which may allow more aggressive use of active chemotherapeutic regimens with reduced side effects and long-term sequelae. Clearly, this research has massive potential implications in the prevention of chemotherapy-induced nerve damage. As shown by Dr. Naguib and his colleagues earlier, the antineoplastic compound paclitaxel inhibits cell division. The drug also induces microglial activation and production of pro-inflammatory mediators in the dorsal horn, contributing to the development and maintenance of central sensitization and pain. MDA, the highly selective CB2 agonist, the, the, the study demonstrated that activation of CB2 receptors by the MDA agonist can uh, modulate microglial dysregulation and attenuate the central sensitization and pain behavior induced by paclitaxel. The findings support this innovation therapeutic approach in treatment of chemotherapy-induced neuropathy. Alzheimer's disease is a neurodegenerative disorder characterized by neuroinflammation, extensive deposits of amyloid beta aggregates, and loss of memory and cognitive abilities. The brains of patients with Alzheimer's disease show increased expression of cannabinoid type 2 receptors, which act as a negative feedback regulator when activated by an agonist. They can help limit the extent of the neuroinflammatory response and the subsequent development of nerve damage in the central nervous system. In this particular investigation, Dr. Naguib and colleagues evaluated the effect of MDA7 on several central nervous system pathological conditions of Alzheimer's disease, including amyloid deposition, inflammatory reaction, and memory impairment. Consistent with previous investigations of neuropathy from Dr. Naguib and colleagues, activation of CB2 receptors by the agonist MDA7 also suppressed neuroinflammation, promoted clearance of amyloid plaques, and promoted recovery of the neuronal synaptic plasticity in the brain. In addition, treatment with MDA7 improved the behavioral performance of mice in the water maze test. Collectively, these findings suggested that MDA7 may have a potential therapeutic effect also in Alzheimer's disease. Dr. Naguib's work presented in this research report was supported by the National Institute on Aging of the National Institutes of Health. It is known that extensive neuroinflammation in Alzheimer's disease causes neuronal and synaptic loss resulting in cognitive impairment. 
the authors reported that microinjections of amyloid fibrils into the rat hippocampal regions induced a decrease in the percentage of silent synapses. The acting, uh, actin cytoskeleton induced by these amyloid fibrils illustrate a potential mechanism for the development of Alzheimer's disease. As described in the author's previous work, amyloid fibrils induce significant neuroinflammation characterized by the activation of microglia and the impairment of synaptic plasticity in the brain that eventually leads to cognitive decline. The abnormal accumulation of these amyloid fibrils in the brain is pathognomonic of Alzheimer's disease. The chemokine fractal kind receptor is primarily located in the brain and its role in the amyloid fibril-induced neuroinflammation and memory deficiency remains debated. Dr. Naguib and colleagues found that microinjection of amyloid beta fibrils into the rodent brain resulted in a significant increase in the chemokine receptor, synaptic dysfunction, and cognitive impairment compared with a control group. The investigators thus concluded that activation of the chemokine receptor plays a central role in the neuroinflammatory response and amyloid-induced neurotoxicity, solving yet another puzzle about the possible ideologies of Alzheimer's disease. As described previously, cannabinoid type 2 or CB2 uh, agonists are neuroprotective and appear to play modulatory roles in neurodegenerative processes in Alzheimer's disease. Dr. Naguib and colleagues have studied the effects of the selective CD2 agonist NDA7 on attenuating the neuroinflammatory process, synaptic dysfunction, and cognitive impairment induced by bilateral microinjection of amyloid beta fibrils into the uh, hippocampal area of uh, rodent brains. The injection of MDA7 decreased the secretion of, of inflammatory cytokines, decreased the upsurge of CB2 receptors, promoted amyloid fibrils clearance, and restored synaptic plasticity, cognition, and memory. These important findings by Dr. Naguib and his collaborators suggested that MDA7 offers a potential therapeutic approach for the treatment of Alzheimer's disease. In this study, Dr. Naguib and his co-authors described the complement C1Q, which plays a critical role in microglial phagocytosis and in the pathogenesis of neuroinflammation in Alzheimer's disease. Specifically, the authors explored the role of astrocytic glutamate uh, transporter in the synaptic complement production and microglial phagocytosis of glutamatergic synapses in a rat model of Alzheimer's disease. The experiments demonstrated that impairment of astrocytic glutamate transporter also plays a role in the pathogenesis of Alzheimer's disease. In another study supported by the National Institutes of Aging of the National Institutes of Health, Dr. Naguib and his collaborators demonstrated a novel molecular mechanism underlying complement C1Q-mediated microglial phagocytosis and the glutamatergic synapses in the rodent model of Alzheimer's disease. This important work further defined the potential mechanisms and etiology of Alzheimer's disease, as well as potential therapies for the uh, treatment of this disease. This narrative review of the group's previous work summarizes the recent findings of the role of cannabinoid type two receptors as potential therapeutic targets in neuropathic pain and neurodegenerative conditions. While the cannabinoid type 
one receptors or CB1 are expressed primarily in the brain, CB2 receptors have been identified peripherally in circulating immune cells, spleen, macrophage derived cells, and liver. The CB2 receptors are induced when there's active inflammation and appear to be devoid of undesired psychotropic effects or addiction liability. Importantly, these CB2 receptors also act as potential therapeutic targets in Alzheimer's disease. Dr. Naguib's work presented in this review was supported by the National Institutes on Aging of the NIH, a testament to the importance and novelty of this research. Once again, I can't but be amazed at the prolific and highly scientific work generated by Dr. Naguib and his collaborators. And really, I should also note that all of this work was performed while Dr. Naguib was working full-time clinically. So I'll now try to summarize some of the seminal work that Dr. Naguib performed in neuromuscular physiology, pharmacology, and monitoring. I would also like to mention that uh, proudly that Muhammad and I co-authored 16 index publications including several that are included in this next section. In seven of these 16 publications, he and I were sole co-authors. So I had ample opportunity to witness the remarkable effort and intellectual depth. This is perhaps one of the most comprehensive and best referenced review articles on the subject of neuromuscular junction and has been a model for me and many of my colleagues. Uh, this review consists of 30 typewritten pages and includes 379 references, an incredible amount of work and expertise that benefited countless investigators in the past 20 years. This meta-analysis was among the first to examine the effect of intraoperative neuromuscular monitoring on the incidence of postoperative residual block. The meta-analysis found that neuromuscular function was assessed subjectively in 16% of patients and that it was measured quantitatively in only 8% of the 3,300 patients that, that were included. This seminal work ignited a continuing and healthy debate on the importance of quantitative neuromuscular monitoring for patient safety. This has been a recurrent theme throughout Muhammad's career and has inspired and changed practice for countless clinicians. As reported almost 50 years ago, uh, postoperative residual neuromuscular block is a frequent occurrence. Previous surveys of clinical practice suggested that neuromuscular blocking drugs were often administered without appropriate monitoring. He compared clinical neuromuscular practices and attitudes between anesthesia practitioners in the United States and Europe and conducted an internet-based of uh, over 2,600 completed surveys were received and 64% of the respondents from the US and 52% of respondents from Europe estimated the incidence of clinically significant postoperative residual neuromuscular weakness to be less than 1%. When in fact, we know that this incidence is upwards of 50%. Despite this common occurrence of this avoid avoidable complication, over 19% of European and almost 10% of American anesthesiologists actually never used neuromuscular monitors. We concluded that efforts to improve awareness by developing formal training programs and publishing official guidelines on best practices to reduce the incidence of postoperative neuromuscular weakness and patient morbidity were warranted. This is a comprehensive and I think clinically relevant review that addresses several selected core questions regarding neuromuscular blockade monitoring and one that provided a framework to uh, rationally discuss and help develop 
basic guidelines for the use of neuromuscular uh, blocking agents in patient care and also monitoring of their effects. Some of the talks that were included in this review were identification of the various stages of neuromuscular block, the definition of neuro, uh, residual neuromuscular block and its incidence, the incidence of adverse events associated with residual block, the definition of monitoring and how peripheral nerve stimulators do not actually qualify as monitors, the clinical advantages of monitoring the train of four ratio, and the time course of neuromuscular blockade measured at peripheral versus central muscles. In this important publication, as a follow-up to our previous international survey, we uh, convened a panel of clinician scientists with expertise in neuromuscular blockade monitoring, medical education, and psychology with a change with a charge to prepare a consensus statement on indications for and proper use of neuromuscular monitors. The aims of the consensus statement were to, one, provide a rationale and scientific basis for the use of quantitative neuromuscular monitoring. Number two, offer a set of recommendations for monitoring standards. Number three, to specify educational goals, and number four, to propose training recommendations to ensure proper neuromuscular monitoring and management. The panel recommended that whenever a neuromuscular blocker is administered, neuromuscular function must be monitored by observing the evoked muscular response to peripheral nerve stimulation. Ideally, this should be done at the hand muscles and not at the facial muscles with a quantitative monitor. The panel also recommended that subjective evaluation of the responses to trainer force stimulation using a peripheral nerve stimulator or clinical tests of recovery, such as the five second head lift, be abandoned in favor of quantitative monitoring. Importantly, for clinician acceptance, the panel acknowledged that publishing the statement per se, would not necessarily result in its spontaneous acceptance or in a change in routine clinical practice. Implementation of objective monitoring would likely require professional societies and anesthesia department leadership to champion its use. One of the many clinical issues that has uh, always been on Muhammad's mind was the common occurrence of undetected postoperative residual neuromuscular block that increases the risk of potentially serious uh, adverse events, particularly postoperative pulmonary complications. As reported previously, a significant majority of anesthesiologists fail to use quantitative devices or even conventional peripheral nerve stimulators routinely. We hypothesize that a contributing factor to the non-utilization of neuromuscular monitoring was the anesthesiologist's overconfidence in their knowledge and in their ability to manage the use of neuromuscular blocking drugs without monitor guidance. So to investigate this attitude, 1,629 anesthesiologists from 80 countries completed a nine-question true-false survey and they also rated their own confidence in the accuracy of their responses. The anesthesiologists correctly answered only 57% of the questions. In contrast, the mean confidence they self-rated was 84%, which obviously was significantly greater than their accuracy. In fact, of the 1,600 respondents, almost 1,500 or 92% of them were overconfident. So we surmised that this overconfidence may be partially responsible for the failure to adopt routine perioperative neuromuscular monitor. It's because when clinicians are highly confident in their knowledge about a procedure, they're less likely to modify their clinical practice or to seek further guidance. 
So after this brief summary of his seminal work, allow me to say just a few words about Muhammad, the, the family man. In speaking with anyone who knew Muhammad, most people spontaneously offered a single word to describe him. He was a Renaissance man, one of the kindest, most considerate people I have known. He had that special quality of finding the best traits in everyone. He was a family man, and he was very proud of his daughters and their accomplishments. During almost every discussion I may have had with Muhammad, the topic invariably would lead to his family, his wife, Mona Sabri, and his three daughters, Yomna, Mai, and Yusuf. In speaking with others who knew him, Muhammad was always described as an honest, straightforward, kind, and perceptive human being. Notably, several of his friends and colleagues, when asked to summarize their thought about Muhammad, independently said that he was a Renaissance man. Muhammad has an unflappable operating room presence. He was understated and never lost poise. And I wholeheartedly agree with the statement made by one of his colleagues, my life is better for having known him. Despite his many accomplishments, Muhammad was modest and shy. When I congratulated him for winning uh, yet another award, and this one was from the Clinton Clinic, his response was, well, I'm living among women, and that explains my good behavior. Despite the facade of seriousness that he exuded as a scientist, Muhammad was actually a very sociable, an affable person who loved his adopted country, the United States. In this photograph, he and his wife, Mona Sabri, were celebrating the 4th of July in Dr. Dave Brown's home. And speaking of celebration of holidays, I really don't think that there has ever been one single occasion in more than the two decades that we were friends when he missed sending me a card, an email, or calling me. As I mentioned, Muhammad was blessed with an adoring and supportive family. Yusser, the youngest daughter, has followed his footsteps and his love for anesthesiology. In one of our many discussions, Yusser, who is 12 and 16 years younger than her uh, two elder sisters, she quipped, my dad once told me, I brought you into my life just so that I can live long. Aside from medicine and anesthesia, he was a passionate painter and he loved the quiet times when he was creating. I really hope that you'll enjoy these works as, of, of art as much as I do because they offer a glimpse into his kind nature and perceptive soul. I don't really think that these paintings need much commentary, whether one loves art or not, I'm sure we all appreciate the beauty in these pieces, all from the paintbrush of one of our dear colleagues. In the next few slides, I wanted to give you a glimpse of Muhammad as the ultimate father, wise man, teacher, and role model. This is an excerpt from the personal statement penned by his daughter, Yusuf, as part of her application to uh, a residency program, which I had the pleasure of reading at the time. I believe it distills what Muhammad meant to his family and the role model that he was, not only to his daughters, but to all those who knew him. This is another typical situation when Muhammad would take incredible amounts of time to discuss, explain, and teach. There are few other colleagues who had the same depth and breadth of knowledge about so many topics. I know that I have benefited tremendously from our friendship and collaboration. And many times he actually explained to me things that I should do with my own inventions. Amazing. For those of you who have had the privilege of knowing Muhammad personally, the, uh, this photograph may bring a smile to your face as it does to mine. 
the pathognomonic index finger pointing downward, accompanied by the words, you see, you see, were actually typical of the ultimate educator who always had an important perceptive and kind comment. This is unfortunately one of the last photographs that I have with Muhammad. In the center is Dr. Glenn Murphy, also our friend and frequent collaborator. In my career, I've had the privilege of meeting and working with true academic giants who have pushed the boundaries of science and patient safety to where we are today. The knowledge gained would undeniably lead us forward. And Dr. Muhammad Naguib's legacy will undoubtedly continue. I think it is incumbent upon the, uh, upon the new generation of Renaissance men and women scientists to expand the horizons of science for our patients' benefit. So I have attempted to synthesize the essence of the many areas of expertise that Dr. Muhammad Naguib developed over his lifetime and to give you a glimpse into his kind and loving soul. I do believe that his pioneering work in neurodegenerative diseases and Alzheimer's will continue in his NIH funded lab and in other labs that he undoubtedly inspired. Similarly, I can assure you that his seminal work in patient safety and his fight to eradicate the postoperative complications associated with residual neuromuscular block will continue unabated as he has recruited and mentored many clinical scientists dedicated to these goals. It's impossible for anyone to describe in 45 minutes or less the impact that one person may have. And it's even more difficult to synthesize the enormous contributions of a person like Muhammad Gugi. What I presented was truly from my heart, a brief window into the life and work of a genius who has helped us all take better care of our patients. And for that, we should all be eternally grateful. Farewell, my dear brother, you are missed. Wow, thank you, Soren. That was uh, an incredible uh, survey of uh, a man who I think has personally touched many of us here. And for those who he hasn't touched personally, has touched through his work, um, as everybody in anesthesia, I think, has been. Um, thank you very much for that, uh, that uh, history. Um, I think we have a brief break here, and uh, then we'll come back for our moderated posters in uh, just about 15 minutes. Um, everybody is welcome to stay on and uh, discuss any other memories or thoughts about Muhammad. Uh, we do have also a brief sec uh, section, which will be reminiscent.